It's not just this standard. This is some other work that I came across by a chap called Mansfeld and his colleagues. And they looked at aluminium alloys and connected all sorts of different alloys to that and uh, worked out the current that flowed versus the potential difference there. And certainly, generally, if you have a small potential difference, your galvanic current is very low. If you have a large potential difference, um, then your current is high. So joining silver and copper certainly caused major problems. But there were a lot of combinations there with fairly large potential differences that only created small galvanic current. So it's, uh, other workers have found this as well, that just because you have a big potential difference doesn't mean you'll have a major galvanic problem. And why is this? Why is it that we can't just use those potentials? I won't go into this in detail. It's, um, uh, there's all sorts of papers and things, work done on that. But the main issue is that if I do this sort of test by itself here, all that's happening is that the metal is corroding and going into solution and just staying there. But of course, in the real world, uh, you would have the uh, metal being activated. So as soon as you join the two, the current would start rising. But then we'd start getting protective films with time. We've done this all almost instantaneously, but if I leave that, a film will build up affecting it. However, perhaps the most important thing is that you're going to get the various uh, reactions occurring and they're going to interfere with one another. So as I say, all that's happening here is that the um, uh, metal ions just go into solution and they stay there. In the real world, they're going to react with the hydroxyl ions formed at the cathodic sites. So that's going to form, in some cases, something corrosive, in some cases, a protective film, in some cases, it's going to stay in solution. So all sorts of funny things are going to happen because we're creating all these ions due to the anodic and the cathodic reaction, and they're all going to mix together. And then the various components of the, of the seawater, the carbonates and chlorides and things are going to come into it as well. So there's just so many um, complexities there. And if you have a look at some of the research papers, you'll see when they try to monitor current versus time, it just goes all over the places, just because as you build up one iron and then it precipitates out and something else takes over, it's very difficult to uh, uh, get consistent results. So some of the factors that influence the galvanic potential Obviously, the alloying element. So, uh, for example, here's the, going back to the Inco series again, is copper. If we join a more uh, active, more anodic metal to it, such as zinc, we form the brasses. So that's slightly uh, less, uh, more negative. And if you join more noble metals, such as nickel and things, then it becomes more positive. And you find this as well with aluminium alloys. If you join zinc, then it becomes less negative. If you join copper, it becomes more positive. And the other thing you find, of course, is that, that if you get a passive film, the behaviour. So we've already hinted at this. If you have stainless steel and um, uh, aluminium alloys, then passive film will form there. So uh, as soon as we get a passive film, put chromium in the metal, it starts corroding. And in fact, we can use the galvanic series to um, work out whether a p you have a passive metal or not. So if you take the galvanic potential, compare it to the EMF potential, electromotive um, force one, and uh, convert that to the, the saturated calomel and find the difference between them, if you get a very noble change there, then you're getting a passive film. So the passive film par excellence, of course, is on titanium. You're getting about a two volt difference there. With the chromium alloys, we're getting about a volt difference. With aluminium, we're getting a, a volt difference there. And um, interestingly, magnesium and beryllium also are passive films, but they're just so uh, active to start off with, you're not getting much improvement uh, in, in the real world. They still act as anodes. Uh, so, nickel is often considered to be a passive metal. In fact, it's not all that. It, nickel is more inherently corrosion resistant rather than um, a passive metal. Um, sometimes you'll see cadmium classed as a passive metal. No, it's not. It's uh, an inherently, uh, it doesn't form a passive film. But uh, titanium is the one that we mainly use. So, just moving through these, I see time is getting away from me a bit. Um, 
So from this work, uh, if you have a passive alloy there, then really you only get severe corrosion if you have a passive alloy, if your potential difference is around about half a volt. So we said generally about 0.3 volts, but if it's a passive alloy, it needs to be quite a bit higher than that. Just some other work uh, on, in this case, on anode and cathode areas, and this is some work by these people here. They looked at mild steel, copper and titanium and joined various metals and they found that the very important thing was the area ratio. So uh, it's, it's a, I'll just go through the actual findings and come back to that. First of all, that copper alloys don't cause galvanic corrosion of other copper alloys. If you have a large anode and a small cathode, uh, no corrosion other than for zinc. So um, the small area there, very small amounts of corrosion. This black one here is steel and it has quite a high basic corrosion rate by itself. But if you have a very uh, large anode and a very small cathode, you don't get any additional corrosion rate for most combinations. If, however, you have the other way around, a large cathode and a small anode, you will get very severe corrosion on uh, iron, aluminium and uh, zinc. Um, and you'll find that you will get problems with copper alloys with more noble metals. Titanium, as we mentioned, is a very passive material, really only affects mild steel. Uh, it wasn't tested with zinc there. And mild steel affected equally by all cathodic metals. So here's the mild steel with the unfavourable uh, anode cathode area, and you see much the same cor corrosion rate um, regardless of what metal it's, it's connected to. And the little green ones there are titanium, generally having very little effect on most of these alloys studied there, other than on uh, steel. Similar work done by Tony Truman and his colleagues at DSTO a few years ago. They looked at marine type alloys and uh, found, again, very little effect between the various um, copper alloys. So here's the corrosion. In, in this case, they're looking at the actual corrosion current there. Very little corrosion between the various copper alloys and uh, the stainless steels there. Uh, mild steel, of course, corrodes by itself, but the additional corrosion from galvanic action only with the copper alloys there and, to a certain extent, with ferulium 255 stainless steel. So large anode, small cathode, again, not a problem. Mild steel, the only one to suffer significant corrosion. Copper alloy is a major problem with mild steel. Uh, the duplex uh, 255 affects the mild steel with an unfavourable area and the passive metals. So again, uh, we generally don't have problems with passive metals. We generally... Um, uh, you, you need to have that large cathode area. So I'm getting... Um, uh, sped up here. That took me a little bit longer than I thought. So uh, I might just move on to um, the final um, factors and things and uh, we can come up with a, uh, a corrected galvanic series then. So what we've got here is taking all these factors into account, we can produce a, a reasonable galvanic series. So we start off platinum graphite, always cathodes, they're very positive. Titanium, various nickel chromium alloys around about 0.0. The passive alloys, less effective cathodes, only really a problem with strongly anodic metals. Stainless steels, less effective cathodes. Nickel alloys and copper alloys, very effective cathodes for more anodic metals. Normal stainless steels, um, ferritic, martensitic, passive, less effective. Lead, tin can be effective cathodes. Iron down here, corroded by more cathodic metals, protected by more anodic ones. So iron will be certainly affected by copper and nickel alloys, less affected by the stainless steels. Aluminium is passive, of course, but uh, corroded by the more cathodic metals. Zinc and magnesium, very uh, anodic potentials, so almost, if you connect them to most common metals, they'll obviously be corroded. 
So galvanic corrosion, likely only if we have a potential difference of more than about 0.4 volts. Textbooks will say uh, 0.1 or 0.2, it needs to be higher than that. More likely to get it if you have a very large cathode to anode. More likely for the more severe environment and more likely if your cathode is not passive. Less likely, or you can forget about it, if you have a large anode. Less likely if you have a mild environment and less likely if you have a passive cathode. We didn't have time to go into this, but in the atmosphere, the actual amount of corrosion on the anode, very small, um, around about five millimetres or so. People come up to me, oh, look, I've got two metals joined and there's some corrosion a metre or so away. Well, it's not caused by galvanic corrosion. In the atmosphere, your galvanic corrosion, just the order of um, millimetres or so. Underwater, it can be a lot further, but in the atmosphere, it's fairly small. So a lot more to, to galvanic corrosion than just me looking at the potentials. Just finally, the title of my uh, talk, Who Rusts First? Where did I find that line? Come off it, Mr. Dent. You can't win, you know. You can't lie in front of the bulldozers indefinitely. I'm game. We'll see who rusts first. You're going to have to accept it, you know. So as in many things, uh, Douglas Adams was there before all of us. So thank you very much for your, your attention. Thanks much. Friends, you will agree that very exciting, scintillating talk by our own Rob Francis. We have time for one or maybe two quick questions, depending on how long the first one takes. <laughs> so anyone with a very quick question for Rob? If uh, there is none from the audience, I have one. Uh, in the textbook, Rob, people also talk about distance effect, and it's only qualitative distance you know, from the interface yeah. of the two. Uh, are there any quant quantitative understanding of that? Um, now, uh, as I mentioned at the end, um, if it's a very um, insulating environment, then the effect of the galvanic corrosion is very small, only the order of millimetres. If it's a very conductive environment like seawater, it can go centimetres, perhaps even metres. So it depends on the conductivity of the environment. Well, <coughs> Please join me in thanking Rob again for the scintillating talk. <laughs>